Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to today's lecture. This is Dr. Renu Bharadwaj, your course coordinator. Over the last few lectures, we have tried to cover the principles behind the methods of diagnosis of different types of microbial diseases, whether bacteria, viruses, fungi or parasites. Today we start with the actual infections which you will commonly encounter in your clinical practice. The infection we are starting with are the superficial infections which essentially are infections of the skin, soft tissue and muscles. The current talk will cover spectrum of soft tissue infections and their possible causative agents. There will be a workup of a case of a carbuncle, its laboratory diagnosis and management. The common causative agent of soft tissue infections, Staphylococcus aureus will be covered in detail, its morphology, clinical manifestations pathogenesis, antimicrobial resistance, treatment and prevention in the hospital scenario. Other staphylococci will also be covered in brief. The soft tissue infections can be classified into focal and diffuse. The focal infections are those simple infections like boils and sty which we encounter in day to day life. The same focal infections with the necrotizing focus in between could be focal and necrotizing and if there is a toxin element added to them, they become focal and toxic. Diffuse infections can be mild cellulitis, severe cellulitis and necrotizing cellulitis. Simple soft tissue infections arise in the skin or in the adnexal skin structures, particularly in the hair follicles. Impetigo contagiosa, an infection of skin abrasions on the face, limbs of children is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. The picture shows an infection caused on a graze of the knee by a child which was infected by Staphylococcus aureus. So, it is a picture of impetigo contagiosa. Folliculitis is an infection of the hair follicle that may extend to form furuncles or coles to form carbuncles. Focal necrotizing infections present either as melanies, progressive synergistic gangrene or as Fourniers idiopathic gangrene. The melanies progressive synergistic gangrene is characterized by erythema, cyanosis and necrosis. It is usually associated with operative wounds, pressure sores and it is caused by microphilic, uh, microaerophilic streptococci, staphylococci aureus or gram negative bacilli. The Furnier's idiopathic scrotal gangrene is again a mixed infection caused by anaerobic streptococci and or, or gram negative bacilli which could usually be E. coli or Klebsiella. Okay. The focal and toxic manifestations are usually toxin associated and they manifest as scalded skin syndrome or toxic shock syndrome. The scalded skin syndrome occurs frequently in young children and sometimes in neonates. It presents as a diffuse rash progressing to generalized bullet that break and slough. It often presents the child looks like he has suffered from a burns. The toxic shock syndrome presents with fever and a generalized macular rash hypotension, vomiting and diarrhea. It usually develops in a patient with vaginitis after the use of tampons, but may also occur after infections at other sites also. The more generalized infections more commonly present as cellulitis. The mild form of cellulitis is very commonly seen. A diffuse infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue is characterized by local spreading erythema warmth, tenderness and swelling. Most infections are mild and are caused by Staphylococcus aureus or group A streptococci. A more severe form of this presentation that is the severe cellulitis may present as facial cellulitis which may originate in the teeth or gums or as erysipelas which is caused by streptococci or haemophilus influenza type B. 
on the hands of fish and meat handlers through minor cracks sometimes organisms like erysipelothrix enter and cause severe cellulitis. Infected animal and human bites of the hands are also associated with severe cellulitis when secondly infected resulting in tenosynovitis. Common pathogens are Pasteurella maltosida which is seen in cat bites and Iconella corodens and other anaerobes which is seen in human bites. Diffuse necrotizing cellulitis is characterized by subcutaneous edema progressing to skin vesicles, skin discoloration and patchy necrosis. There are usually one, two types necrotizing infections in which inflammatory cells are absent or sparse. This is commonly seen with clostridial myonecrosis or gas gangrene as it is commonly known, melanie streptococcal gangrene. Conditions in which inflammatory cells are abundant are usually associated with gram negative bacterial infections which could range from E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas and other gram negative bacilli. The spread of infection in subcutaneous tissue is usually associated with toxins and enzymes produced by the infecting organisms. Marked inflammation is observed and can be attributed to cytokines such as interleukins, tumor necrosis factor produced by dendritic cells when exposed to bacterial components. The interesting thing is that the inflammatory response may persist even when the bacteria have been killed by antibiotics. A 48 year old male came to the surgical OPD with complaints of painful swelling on the back of his neck of 7 days duration and fever. He started discharging pus 3 days back. On examination, an irregular swelling 5 cm by 4 cm was seen on the back of the neck. It showed erythema and was warm to touch. Multiple openings exuding pus were seen one of the openings had become crusted. <clears throat> on general examination, the patient was febrile, had a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade, pulse was 100 per minute, respiration was regular and normal, systemic examination, no abnormality was detected. Investigations, <coughs> blood test was done, hemogram showed total leukocyte counts were raised with a predominance of neutrophils, fasting blood sugar 200 milligrams per deciliter, so patient was referred to a clinician for investigation and control of diabetes. A provisional diagnosis of carbuncle was made, needle aspirate of the purulent discharge was taken and sent to the microbiology laboratory for culture and sensitivity. Patient was given provisionally amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. The aspirate when transferred to the laboratory was transferred in a sterile container. A smear was made from the aspirate and was stained with the gram stain. The smear showed plenty of pus cells and gram positive cocci arranged in clusters. These are the pus cells and these are the gram positive cocci arranged in clusters. The gram positive cocci were 1 micron in size, non capsulated, non sporing. The impression the smear gave was that the infecting organism was staphylococci. A blood culture was advised considering the severity of infection to rule out bacteremia or septicemia associated with it. The common staphylococci infecting man are usually divided into coagulase positive and coagulase negative. The major pyogenic pathogen is Staphylococcus aureus which is coagulase positive. The coagulase negative ones also cause infections and they are usually the Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphylococcus saprophyticus, Staphylococcus leucdensis and Staphylococcus hemolyticus. The sample was then plated onto various media plates, the blood agar plate, the McConkey's agar plate and the nutrient agar plate and incubated at 37 degrees for 18 to 24 hours. Next morning when the plates were examined, the blood agar plate showed beta hemolytic colonies 2 to 4 millimeters in diameter, smooth, shiny, regular. So, these are the colonies which were seen with a clear zone of beta hemolysis around it. If this zone was greenish in color, it would have been referred to as an alpha hemolytic zone and if it was no, there was no zone around the colonies, it would be referred to as a non hemolytic zone. The colonies on nutrient agar showed golden yellow pigment and were suggestive of Staphylococcus aureus. The coagulase negative Staphylococci also give pigment on nutrient agar. Lemon yellow colonies are seen with Staphylococcus citrus and white colonies are seen with Staphylococcus albus. Sometimes the pigment is not very clear and you need to enhance the pigment. In that case, it is grown either on milk agar or 1 percent glycerol monoacetate agar and you will see here the pigment of cell staphylococcus 
citrus has been enhanced and you get bright lemon yellow colored colonies. When the same or colonies were plated on potassium telluride agar they grew black colored colonies due to reduction of telluride into tellurium in the medium. So, these are the black colored colonies of staphylococcus aureus on potassium telluride agar. On McConkie's agar sometimes staphylococcus may not grow if it grows it produces small pink colonies. A smear was made from the colonies and stained with gram stain. Again gram positive cocci in clusters were seen. These gram positive cocci in clusters resembled that of a bunch of grapes. That is where the organism gets, gets its name because the word staphylae remember is called referred to as a bunch of grapes and because they are tiny and round the organism is called staphylococcus. Now why are they arranged in this peculiar arrangement as a bunch of grapes? because they divide in three different planes and once they divide in three different planes the daughter cells they attach to the mother cell and since they stay attached to the mother cell they give the appearance of a bunch of grapes. Now having confirmed that this is staphylococci the next step was okay, we need to confirm which staphylococci but even before that the first test which was done biochemically to confirm it was a catalase test which was done to differentiate between staphylococci and micrococci. Now the principle of this test is if the organism produces an enzyme catalase it breaks down hydrogen peroxide to reduce oxygen bubbles. So the organism which is giving bubbles is catalase positive. So our particular organism which was the test organism produced bubbles and it is catalase positive. A positive control also gives bubbles while the negative control give, did not give any bubbles. Now this confirmed that this is staphylococci and helped to differentiate it from a similar looking organism that is micrococci. Now once we have confirmed that it is staphylococcus we need to differentiate it from the coagulase positive and the coagulase negative staphylococci. So for that the coagulase test has to be done. The coagulase test can be done in two different ways. One is the slide test and the other is the tube test. The slide test essentially picks up the clumping factor which is a part of the bacterial cell wall. A drop of the plasma human or rabbit plasma is added to a saline suspension of organisms and clumping looked for. Now if you see this picture you will see clumping on the right hand side. This is a picture of the clumped organisms indicating that this organism was coagulase test positive. While the picture on the left hand side shows a smooth suspension that there is no autoagglutination that means the organism was coagulase negative. So our test organism in this case was a coagulase test positive organism by the slide test. The slide coagulase test has its limitations and may give false positivity due to autoagglutination and certain coagulase negative staphylococci also may give the slide test negative. So to confirm we need to do a tube test also. Now the tube test picks up the free coagulase and not the bound coagulase as picked up by the slide test. It also detects the ability to clot a variety of mammalian plasma, broth culture and plasma in a tube are incubated at 37 degrees for 4 to 6 hours to look for a clot. The principle is that the free coagulase in the presence of coagulase reacting factor which is also present in the plasma will combine with fibrinogen and convert it to fibrin which makes the plasma semi solid and it will not flow even if you tilt the tube. So this is the appearance of a tube test coagulase positive. The differences between the free and bound coagulase are shown in this slide. Free coagulase is secreted in the medium while bound coagulase is a component of the cell wall. Free coagulase requires the help of coagulase reacting factor or CRF before it can act while bound coagulase is independent of coagulase reacting factor. There are seven types of free coagulase while there is only one type of bound coagulase. The free coagulase is heat labile while the bound coagulase is heat stable. So these characters can be used to differentiate the free coagulase from the bound coagulase. Other biochemical reactions which were used to confirm the identity of the organism were fermentation of sugars, the organism fermented sugars with acid only, characteristically mannitol was fermented which is a characteristic of Staphylococcus aureus, nitrates were reduced to nitrites, gelatin was liquefied, there was lipolysis on egg yolk agar, phosphatase and DNA tests were positive, other positive tests were indol, methyl red, Vox proscus, citrate and urease. This is a picture of a DNA test 
which the medium contains DNA and if the organism is producing DNAs, you will get an area of clearing around the, or, or around the colonies indicating that this is DNA positive. This particular organism is DNA is test negative, so there is no clearing around the colonies. Phosphatase is again an important enzyme produced by the organism. Diphosphates are incorporated into the medium. If the organism produces phosphatase, the diphosphates are broken down and then when this particular plate is exposed to ammonia, you will get pink colored colonies indicating that the organism has produced phosphatase. So, just to summarize differentiation between staph aureus and the coagulase negative staph can be done on the basis of coagulase production, mannitol fermentation, DNA's positivity, beta hemolysis and a golden yellow pigment. All these are given by staphylococcus aureus and not given by the two important coagulase negative staphylococci that is staphylococcus epidermidis and staphylococcus saprophyticus. Now, to differentiate these two, the only test that we have is a novobycin resistance which is given by staphylococcus saprophyticus and not by epidermidis. So, just to summarize the characteristic of staphylococcus aureus which was our pathogen in this particular case, it gives coagulase. So, coagulase production is positive, DNA's production is present, mannitol fermentation is there, beta hemolysis on blood agar was seen, pigment production was seen, gelatin liquefaction was seen, phosphatase production was seen and telluride reduction was seen. So, the isolate obtained from the patient was definitely staphylococcus aureus. Once the organism was identified, its antibiotic sensitivity was done. This was done as per the standards provided by the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute and the following antibiotic discs were put up that is the cefoxetin, chloramphenicol, ciprofloxacillin, erythromycin, gentamicin, penicillin, tetracycline, trimethoprim, sulfamexazole. Our particular isolate that is staphylococcus aureus was sensitive to cefoxetin, erythromycin, chloramphenicol, ciprofloxacillin and gentamicin. Sensitivity is noted by seeing the size of the diameter around the disc. So, if this diameter is measured around this disc and compared with the standards, you can label the isolate as sensitive resistance or intermediate sensitive. So, these are the standard methods for doing sensitivity of any pathogen. The patient came into the category of simple focal lesions. So, topical antibiotics that is mupressin 2 percent ointment was applied thrice daily, oral cloxicillin every 6 hours was given for 7 days, cleaning of the wound and attention to hygiene was addressed. If there was a different type of a lesion, there was a focal necrotizing disease or a lesion with toxic symptoms, the treatment would have been intravenous fluid resuscitation, antibiotics such as amoxicillin and gentamicin as a combination therapy or a monotherapy such as tricarcillin with clavulonic acid, wide debridement of the necrotizing lesion. In toxic shock syndrome, the culprit vaginal tampon must be removed. Severe and high risk cellulitis, intravenous antibiotics such as ceftriaxone and quinolones are important. For dog and cat bites, amoxicillin clavulonic acid is adequate. Diffuse necrotizing infections require aggressive surgical debridement. For the toxic shock syndrome, intravenous clindamycin slows the M protein synthesis and is essential for exotoxin production. Human immunoglobulins help to neutralize the existing exotoxin and the patient recovers faster. Staphylococcus aureus, apart from the presentation we have just seen as a subcutaneous infection and in our particular case as a carbuncle can have various other clinical manifestations. It can have respiratory infections such as sinusitis, bronchopneumonia, lung abscesses and empyema. It can present with CNS infections such as meningitis, brain abscess, intracranial infections, UTI in case of predisposing factors specifically diabetes and if the patient is catheterized, chances of getting a staphylococcus urinary tract infection are more. Musculoskeletal infections can be osteomyelitis, arthritis and bursitis. It is a very common cause of hospital infections specifically in the burns unit and in the surgical wards. The toxin mediated diseases caused by staphylococcal aureus can be summarized as food poisoning, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome and the toxic shock syndrome which we have already discussed in brief. The one of the toxin mediated diseases is food poisoning. It is formed due to a preformed toxin in food. The food responsible are meat, fish, milk and milk products like kheer. Staphylococci will grow to produce toxin. After they have grown, they will produce the toxin in the food and they have a short incubation period of 2 to 6 hours. 
clinical features are nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Enterotoxin is potent and can cause infection in micrograms. The disease is usually self limited and does not require antibiotic treatment. Now, to isolate the staphylococci from the food sample or from the stool of a patient of food poisoning where a lot of other organisms will be present requires a selective medium. The selective medium used for stool and food material is a mannitol salt agar. On mannitol salt agar, yellow colored colonies of Staphylococcus aureus are seen with the yellow zone around it. So, wherever we are trying to isolate Staphylococcus aureus from a sample which is likely to be contaminated with many other organisms, this particular medium that is the mannitol salt agar is used. The other toxin producing disease that the toxic shock syndrome is caused by the Staphylococcus aureus which produces the toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 and enterotoxins A to E. Clinical features are it presents with headache, vomiting, diarrhea, myalgia, erythematous rash. Complications can be acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, DIC and renal failure. Laboratories, uh, laboratory abnormalities observed in these patients are immature pleocytosis, decrease in blood levels of albumin, pyuria, proteinuria, increase in blood urea, nitrogen and CPK. In patients with scalded skin syndrome, the outer layer of the epidermis gets separated from the underlying tissue. It is known as Reuter's disease in the newborn and toxic epidermal necro necrolysis in the elderly. It is very commonly seen as outbreaks in neonatal nurseries. How does this staphylococci cause disease and such a variation of diseases? The cocci first get access to damaged skin or mucosa. They colonize there by adhering to the cells. They evade the host defense and multiply and cause damage. Damage is essentially caused by virulence factors. Some of them are present on the surface and they are referred to as surface factors. Some of them are released as enzymes and some of them are released as toxins and can spread far and wide from the site of infection. Now, virulence factors or the surface factors are essentially first is the capsular polysaccharide. Now, this capsular polysaccharide inhibits opsonization and phagocytosis. The next is the pepto peptidoglycan layer which is present in the cell wall. It activates complements and causes cytokine release. The next is the tecoid acid which is also a part of the cell wall and it facilitates adhesion of the organism to the cell and protects from opsonization. The protein A is chemotactic and antiphagocytic. The enzymes which act as virulence factors are the coagulase which causes the fibrinogen to get converted to fibrin even in the body. The same enzyme is tested for in, uh, in vitro when we are trying to confirm a diagnosis of staphylococcus aureus. Staphylokinase and hyaluronidase help in spreading of the infection into the subcutaneous tissue. The nucleus breaks down the cell because of its DNA's activity. The lipases including fatty acid modifying enzyme help the uh, disease to spread in the lipid layers of the skin. Now, the toxins which it produces are of various types. The first group of toxins which it produces are the hemolysins which can be alpha, beta, gamma or delta. The alpha hemolysin causes an osmotic lysis of the cell. This lysis can be of platelets, monocytes and macrophages. The beta toxin is essentially a sphingomyelinase and it helps in spreading in the subcutaneous tissue. This is encoded for by a lysogenic bacteriophage which has to be present in the bacteria before the beta toxin can be produced. The gamma toxin is present in isolates from deep seated infections commonly. The delta toxin affects all the blood cells again that is right from the RBCs to the leukocytes to the macrophages. So, these are all the hemolysins that is the alpha hemolysin, the beta hemolysin, the gamma hemolysin and the delta hemolysin. It is the gamma hemolysin which is more associated with deep seated infections. Now, there is another lysin which is the pantan valentine leukocidin. This is produced by a bacteriophage encoded gene. It has necrotizing action on skin and lungs and it is associated with usually a community associated methicillin resistant staph aureus infection. Other toxins are the exfoliative or the epidermolytic toxin which acts on the proteins on which maintains the integrity of the epidermis. It causes actually a separation of living layers from dead layers. There is widespread blistering and loss of epidermis and this is what results in the scalded skin syndrome where the patient looks that he has got multiple burns on the skin. Enterotoxins are heat stable 
and they cause toxic shock syndrome and they cause food poisoning. Toxic shock syndrome toxin, it causes one of the most severe manifestations of Staphylococcus aureus essentially because the toxic shock syndrome toxin is a super antigen. It suppresses the chemotaxis of polymorphonuclear leukocytes, it suppresses T cell function and it causes a non-specific activation of all T cells to cause a massive release of cytokines. Now, why does this occur? And normally, when an antigen is presented to the T cell by the antigen presenting cell, it is presented in the group of the MHC class 2 antigen and it gets attached only to specific clones of T cells with which it matches. However, the super antigen or the TSST1 attaches on the outside of this and connects the all T cells to the MHC class 2. So, it activates all T cells irrespective of the receptors present on their surface. This results in a release of large amount of cytokines which cause massive damage and cause massive fall in BP and the patient becomes crit critical. The antibiotics which have been used for staphylococci over the years have varied. The drug of choice was penicillin till 1950, then penicillin resistance developed due to the production of penicillinase or beta lactamase. So, this beta lactamase resistant antibiotics were subsequently developed to cater for this and methicillin, oxacillin and cloxacillin were developed. In 1990, for the first time, methicillin resistance was noted due to alteration in the penicillin binding proteins on the surface of the staphylococci. This was mediated by the MEK-A gene. Cefoxetin resistance is used as a marker. Any organism which is cefoxetin resistance is also methicillin resistance and the cefoxetin is easier to test than methicillin. So, cefoxetin testing is used to diagnose a MRSA or a methicillin resistant staph aureus. If MRSA is present, the drug of choice for treatment would be vancomycin or ticoplanin. MRSA may be hospital acquired or community acquired. Accordingly, they are called as HAMRSAs or CAMRSAs. They get easily disseminated in a hospital environment, often causing outbreaks of post-operative infection, which are called as EMRSAs. Outbreaks need to be identified and controlled. Isolation of a patient and detection of carrier is the first step in trying to curtail the outbreak. Controlling the chain of transmission by hand washing and maintaining cleanliness of the environment is very important to prevent the spread of such infections in the hospital environment. VRSS is a further step in the development of Staphylococci aureus. Once uh, vancomycin is being started used extensively for the treatment of Staphylococcus aureus, the organism developed resistance even to vancomycin. This was due to a VAN-A gene which, which coded for an enzyme which produced alternative peptidoglycons and vancomycin could no longer bind to it. This is difficult to test because the normal conventional disdiffusion methods which we use for testing are not valid for vancomycin which has to be tested by working out the minimum inhibitory con uh, concentration for, for the Staphylococcus aureus before you can prove that it is vancomycin resistance. The alternative drugs for a vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus are linezolate, quinpristine, dalfopristine, daptomycin and tigecycline. Epidemiology of Staph aureus overall, it is ubiquitous, it is present all over in your environment including on your skin sometimes, hospital scenario, asymptomatic carriers are very common. The very common site at which you may be carrying Staphylococci is in the nose or in the perineal region. Spread is usually from human to human. Direct spread can occur or it can be airborne from the environment from dirt present in the on the surfaces of very equi equipment lying in the hospital area. It can be endogenous, so it can be even a staphylococcus aureus present in the nose of the patient who is getting infected or it could be exogenous from outside. Hospital infection is very commonly seen in the burns, wounds, surgical sites usually caused by methicillin resistant staph aureus or MRSA or, or multi-drug resistant staphylococci or MDR staphylococci. To identify the source of the outbreak, we need to know the type of organism we are dealing with. Type means just identification of Staphylococcus aureus is not enough to identify the source of an outbreak. So, we require various typing systems to be able to match the various isolates which we have been collected during an outbreak to make sure they are all from the same source. The common typing method which is used in most hospitals is the phenotyping method which is the bacteriophage typing. A long culture of Staphylococcus aureus is made and it is spot inoculated with a set of standard phages. Phages are viruses which infect bacteria specifically and a clearing is looked for. Now, depending on the pattern of clearing that you get, if there is in this particular picture you are having a clearing to only 3 phages. 
So, this particular pattern would be called by a number depending on these pattern the phages are phage types are identified. The commonest phage types in India are 52, 52 A, 80 and 81. However, better methods are now available. We have molecular typing which is more discriminatory, pulse field gel electrophoresis is one of the methods used, ribotyping, sequence based typing methods such as MLST. However, these are more expensive and technically demanding and not available in the routine laboratory and available only with reference laboratories. Having identified the, how do you prevent these outbreaks from occurring and having an ident identified an outbreak, how do you control it? So, there should be routine screening of indoor patients and hospital personnel for nasal carriage, specifically in the surgical wards or in the burns ward, surface sanitization, all surfaces should be cleaned adequately. Quaternary ammonium compounds can be used for cleaning surfaces because they are long acting. Alcohol based hand rubs should be used between every patient. There should be decolonization of carriers once identified. This can be done by use of chlorhexidine, hexachlorophene soap or 2 percent mupirocin ointment which could be put inside each nostril twice a day for 7 days. Apart from coagulase positive, coagulase positive staphylococcus that is staphylococcus aureus. Though the coagulase negative staphylococci are often present on our skin surfaces, they are also known to cause infections. The common ones are Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is normally present on the skin, but can cause stitch abscesses and septicemias, device associated infections of the bloodstream that is catheter related bloodstream infections are common with this organism. Endocarditis in drug addicts, it is sensitive to novobicin. So, you can identify it from other coagulase negative staphylococci by the zone of inhibition which you see round a novobiosin disc. The other coagulase negative staphylococci which is important is staphylococcus saprophyticus. It is normally present on the skin and periurethral area. It is resistant to novobiosin. So, that is what differentiates it from staphylococcus epidermidis. The diseases which it causes are hospital associated infections in the premature unit, in the burns unit and in the transplant unit. It can cause osteomyelitis, endophthalmitis, it can cause device associated infections. It is commonly present in the periurethral area, so it causes urinary tract infections associated with catheters. So, just to recap today's lecture, subcutaneous infections can be localized or spreading with tissue necrosis or associated with toxin mediated diseases like toxic shock syndrome, food poisoning and scalded skin syndrome. Staphylococcus aureus, a gram positive cocci is a major pathogen of subcutaneous infections. Coagulase test differentiates it from coagulase negative staphylococci which are normally skin flora. Staphylococcus aureus can also cause infections of bones, joints, kidneys, CNS and lungs. It is an important hospital pathogen, hospital personnel are often carriers. It causes diseases due to virulence factors present on its surface and produce extracellularly such as enzymes and toxins. Staphylococcus aureus has developed resistance over the years to various antibiotics resulting in the emergence of MRSA and VRSA. Coagulase negative staph have the capacity to form biofilms, the staph epidermidis causes device associated infections while staph saprophyticus is more commonly cause of urinary tract infections. The pictures which I have used during this lecture have been extended to me by some of my colleagues and some of them have been downloaded over the net. So, these are the references for the figures which I have used over this lecture. Thank you.